So I'm going to be talking today to the Associate Professor in Biosystems and Environmental Change, um, who's also an Alan Turing Fellow, Fellow of the Higher Education Academy and a member of the University of Birmingham Enterprise, which is Professor Louisa Orsini. Thank you so much for inviting me. This is exciting. What, what, do you, what do you guys do? Bioengineering is one of the applications we, we have in, in my line of research, um, also called engineering biology. Uh, this can have different meanings, uh, but in the research that I led, um, I lead, um, it's the manipulation of natural biological agents by engineering to deliver an end-to-end -end sustainable solution for water bioremediation and waste management and valorization. Let me explain. I break it down in simple terms. So what we know is that treatment of wastewater is an essential process for water reuse. And we definitely need it because of increasing drought, climate change, and depletion of uh, clean water. Uh, however, for the reuse of water, we need to remove all contaminants that are currently in there. Because these contaminant chemicals are very hazardous to human and environmental health, causing um, illnesses such as cancer and autoimmune disease. Now, current wastewater treatment processes are not designed to remove these contaminants efficiently. And so what happens is they end up in environment and eventually return to our table through the food chain. So what we are doing is um, using a natural, um, a natural agent, the water flea Daphnia. He's a small invertebrate you will find in fresh water to treat wastewater and to remove all these nasty contaminants so that we can actually reuse water safely. And what Daph Daphnia does, works as a small vacuum cleaner and it uptakes all these chemicals, it accumulates them. Some of them are metabolized, similar to what your liver does for you, and others are accumulated. So the end point of this is clean water we can reuse for household irrigation, agriculture and whatnot. And the other point is that by doing this, we have moved away from treating gigantic volumes of uh, water with trace contaminants, and we have concentrated them in very small amount of biomass that could be very efficiently treated. And then this biomass itself is not discarded, is reused as a fertilizer. So nothing is wasted, everything is recycled. So I just have a question. You, you mentioned about um, the sort of pharmaceuticals and, and I've sort of, you know, done a lot of research on, on water treatment. And, and there is a suggestion that, that things like um, the, the, the components of the pill, like progesterone, estrogen, can persist in, in the water table because the current treatment methods don't work. So does this method um, do, you do a bit of a better job? with regard to those contaminants as well? You just said is exactly the reason why we started working on this, because there is a number of these trace contaminants that come from uh, our use of pharmaceuticals, from industry production, from agriculture, they end up in water. And because they are not efficiently removed, we, um, we have them back <laughs> essentially through the food chain. The Daphnia-based system can remove all of this and with a very high efficiency up to 95%. Some of these chemicals are metabolized in non-toxic products, and so they are not um, carcinogenic or, um, uh, or uh, endocrine disrupting anymore. Others are just accumulated in the body of this small, um, this small uh, invertebrate. But then by doing this concentration, then we are dealing with very small volumes which are much more efficiently treated and all these chemicals are removed for, um, to enable uh, the biomass reuse. So, so obviously thinking about countries that have um, difficulty cleaning water and things like that, so countries like Africa, um, you know, South America, um, how easily could they implement something like this, I mean, using biological systems? 
countries are the ones we are working for the most um, because our technology is um, sustainable green but it's also scalable and low tech and so being low tech doesn't require large infrastructure it fitted it can be applied in um, off grid and actually yes our solution is definitely uh, for developing countries and it is important because in COP26 you know we have somehow to enable developing economies to decarbonize. That's awesome to, to hear. Um, I mean, I guess the question is, it sounds, it sounds amazing uh, that, that usually with, with technology, there are some downsides that need to be overcome. Um, is there, are there any sort of challenges that you've, you've faced in, in these projects? But I think the, the biggest challenge we are facing with these new technologies is simply not knowing what industry and stakeholders need. And to overcome this, we have been working with them from the start. And so these allowed us to co-design solutions so that we can retrofit within their infrastructure. We can adjust the technology to what is their demand in terms of how long um, a wastewater is residing in a tank. So how, how long a time do you need to clean it and what kind of um, what kind of quality do you need in order to meet regulatory uh, requirements? And all these, by working with industry, we have overcome a lot of these limitations. And this is important for adoption. What, what sort of um, standards do you, do you need to work to? You know, so in terms of like, if we compare it to current solutions, let's say in this country, um, wh where would you say that the, the solution sort of takes the, the quality of the water to, by comparison? We have been working to the highest standard and so using, for example, European and US standard, because that would be the highest standard you will need. Many of the developing countries are aligning with these standards um, and therefore we are working towards um, the wastewater to meet the discharge standards that, that are accepted in Europe, US and Western countries. Awesome. So I, I um, read um, about, you, you were sort of talking about an eDNA um, with, re, with regard, so, so could you tell me a little bit about what eDNA is and how it relates to, um, to this project? Um, it doesn't necessarily relate to this project. We use eDNA, also called environmental DNA, uh, to do um, bio, bio monitoring of biodiversity. So environmental DNA is essentially ghost DNA that is left behind uh, in any kind of environmental matrix. This could be soil, water, marine water and so on. And the advantage is that every animal and every plant has left behind a trace. And we can use this trace to, to quantify at different times in the past and division. So how many species were there, what, what were they, how relatively abundant were they. And we do use this technology together with um, chemical analysis of sediment and water to understand how these pollutants or climate change or the combination of both alter essentially biodiversity. The consequences of climate change do not happen overnight and they happen over decades or even more. And for us to be able to pinpoint what's the cause and the effect, we need to create a correlation between changes in climate or pollution and change in biodiversity. In my group, we do this by using environmental DNA applied to sediment. What you do is sample freshwater uh, sediment cores. You date them so you know exactly how old each layer of sediment is. And then from each layer of sediment, you quantify the biological matrix, so the biodiversity, as well as the contaminants that were there at certain time in the past. And you know, you, you can use also um, uh, records of climate in the past. And by doing this and applying artificial intelligence, we can find what um, contaminants or what components of climate might have affected uh, the biological community 
we can go even further, we can identify within these communities what taxonomic groups are most affected. At the end of the day, why do we care? The important point is that the some of these species deliver important functions, and functions translate in so-called ecosystem services. And these services are vital for wildlife and for humans, for livelihood. Examples of ecosystem services are clean water, food provisioning, climate regulation, even you enjoying a day by a lake is a service. So once these pieces are destroyed and disappear from, from the environment, they are not able anymore to deliver these services and we are losing out socioeconomically and uh, biologically a number of services we rely on. What, what sort of are you seeing in terms of climate change and, and its effect from your uh, from the eDNA and from the, your compositional analysis? To working with the UK Environment Agency, so um, it's uh, on real sites they have um, screened over time. What we see that maybe the change in average temperature per se might not cause an, a strong impact on biodiversity. However, the increased recurrence of extreme events like droughts or extreme temperature, especially combined with chemical pollution and especially it is all um, due to a number of taxonomic groups that have disappeared yeah, and primary producers. Some of these bacteria can be toxic. They affect the food chain. They change how many fish um, is there and uh, what invertebrates feed on the lake. And one of the consequences we observed for example, was eutrophication, also called nutrient pollution. So you basically lose the capacity of using a lake because it's highly eutrophic. You cannot even go and swim there anymore. You cannot fish there because some fish don't survive in that condition. So there is a strong impact on the ecosystem function and services.